Hi everyone, welcome to Riot's Lunch and Learn series. My name is Caroline Griffin. I am Riot's Director of Operations and I'm super excited to have Ben Jacobs, a technology transactions lawyer for Four Score Business Law here with us today. Um, just a couple of quick reminders before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded. It will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and then shared via the meetup group where you registered for this event. So you can go back and watch it later if you want. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please do put those in the chat box and I will make sure all of those are answered. And then the last reminder, uh, the best way to view this session is in speaker view. So if you go up to the top and hit view, hit speaker, that'll give you a nice big view of Ben's presentation and then Ben on the right. Um, but without further ado, I will hand it over to Ben Jacob. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Ben. Thanks, Carolyn. I appreciate it. It's great to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing a little bit about the venture funding process and uh, hearing some questions and uh, from the audience. So, uh, so you know, a little bit about myself. Uh, Caroline mentioned I am with Foursquare Business Law. I'm a technology transaction lawyer. We are a corporate boutique law firm uh, with an exceptional team. Um, the firm was founded just over six years ago. So, in a way, we're a startup ourselves. Uh, our team of lawyers have either worked in-house uh, at uh, t technology startups or they've worked at larger law firms and uh, we primarily spend our time working with founders uh, and and early stage companies that are doing interesting things some of our, you know our, our, our favorite clients that have been around for 20 years uh, the common thread is though uh, a focus on innovative technologies that's what we enjoy working with uh, and we love working with entrepreneurs and founders who are, are doing cool things. A um, little brief, brief blurb about me. I, I started uh, as a business litigator um, in Silicon Valley and went in-house to a early stage Y Combinator back company and spent four years there doing a mix of legal and operations and then um, joined Fourscore to help open up our Silicon Valley office about three years ago. And it's been uh, a great ride with a great team and a great firm. Um, so excited to share again what we spend most of our time doing. Let me make sure this is advancing. Um, is helping companies raise money, uh, figure out how to capitalize, get the business and the vision uh, moving forward. And so today the focus is giving an overview of what the process looks like when you and your company are ready to raise capital through an institutional venture capital fund. Um, it is one of many options out there to capitalize your business, as uh, many of you know and have uh, experience with. Um, but it is a unique process. It's exciting. Um, so my goal today is share a little bit about what all is involved um, and, you know, hopefully get you uh, a little more comfortable um, in terms of what that process looks like. Um, about a little bit more about Fourscore, we start every relationship with our clients with the conviction that ideas deserve opportunity. Uh, again, uh, startup, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, those those are ingredients in our DNA as a firm. Uh, we very much consider ourselves a startup uh, ourselves. And four simple principles, you know, one, simplify the complex, meet expectations on pricing, uh, provide superior work quality and respond timely. Those are some simple distinctives that have served us well um, as we try to help early stage companies get going. Okay, so, you know, we're, again, our focus today, we're talking about raising uh funding, financing through a venture capital fund, institutional venture capital fund. But again, there's there's different options out there. There's, you know, here you have the sampling grants that are non-dilutive, meaning you're not giving up equity in the company. That's always nice when you can do that. Uh, convertible notes. This is, you know, for early stage companies, companies just getting off the ground uh, that are not ready for a price round, uh, which is what, we're again, we're talking about uh, today. Uh, so raising via a convertible note or more commonly today, a safe, a simple agreement for future equity. Um, and those are, you know, as the name suggests, they're designed to be simple to allow you to raise capital fast and as simply as possible. 
Um, and those are usually for larger amounts, although uh, seed rounds using safes have definitely grown considerably in size. Um, um, and then equity and debt, you know, equity, you're selling in a price round, you're selling preferred stock typically. Um, and debt, you know, convertible notes, uh, you can go uh, conventional lines of credit. Those are, again, obviously not common options for an early stage technology company because of uh, the risk involved. So uh, moving into um, what we're talking about, uh, raising money through a venture capital fund, it's, it's helpful to understand um, some of the dynamics. Um, it, it's not really going to be the focus today, but understanding the infrastructure, the incentives, and, the, and the, the operating structure of who's investing in you is helpful. And so a venture capital fund is typically, uh, for those that are unfamiliar, is typically uh, you have professional investors. They're putting together a fund uh, of limited partners uh, that are investing money, and then they're going out and investing in companies. And so you, as the startup or the founder, uh, looking to go the venture capital route, you're looking to sell uh, preferred stock uh, at a fixed price um, that values your company at a certain valuation. Um, and so, again, these are some options uh, that are out there, and we're going to be focusing on venture capital. So at Fourscore, we think of uh, venture financing timeline uh very specific to our process, but this is whether you're, you know, working with our team or another firm, uh, this is generally speaking going to be uh, the timeline that you're looking at. And um, one distinction that I, I, I did want to mention, this is, this presentation is not geared towards helping you decide whether you should raise uh, a, a price round and sell preferred stock. It's really focused on, helping you understand what the process looks like. But we will talk about in this first stage, this pre-term sheet stage, um, a little bit about uh, some of the considerations uh, in play. So in, in the venture financing timeline, uh, our first uh, step in the timeline is the pre-term sheet. So this is before you've received and signed a term sheet with your lead investor. Um, there's a couple important things that need to happen. Uh, number one, the biggest uh, is making sure you you know how you want to capitalize your business. And so we're looking at venture financing. We just looked very briefly at some of the other options out there. Um, timing is very important. And uh, there's a lot of um, – th it's very attractive to go out and raise money from a, a, a well-known uh, venture fund like Andreessen and Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins – um, but it's not always the right fit for your company. And so doing your homework and making sure you understand exactly what the other side, the investor is going to be looking for um, in terms of the stage of your business uh, is a key step um, in, in making sure that you're choosing the right financing option to give your business the capital it needs to get to the next stage of your business. Um, so, that is the, the, the question that we're going to assume that you've answered, that venture financing is the right uh, way to go. And um, one of the, 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 the key parts pre-term sheet is doing your corporate cleanup. Um, today, there are a lot of – there are increasingly better options for handling your formation work, getting your company set up. Uh, getting your uh, you know, charter filed with the you know typically it's going to be the Delaware Secretary of State, getting uh, you know your your the basic company structure set up, getting the operating documents in place. There are better and better automated solutions. You know companies like Clerky, uh, Gust. Uh, some of these companies we're, we're even our firm is partnered with, um, and they will send us uh, companies when they're ready uh, and and needing a relationship um, because. Those solutions can be good for formation as long as you know what inputs to enter. Um, but if you don't know what inputs to enter, you can often end up with um, some basic corporate governance uh, problems that need to be cleaned up before uh, the company's – definitely before the company's ready to raise funding, uh, but really it's something that should be cleaned up as soon as possible. So with, with – at Foursquare, you know, when we have a client come in, part of our onboarding process involves – uh, doing a, an intake, an expanded intake, where we take all of your corporate documents, 
review them, making sure your house is in order. Um, and especially if you're looking at uh, beginning conversations with a, an institutional investor, you're going to want to make sure you have your ducks in a row that uh, any cleanup that's needed, this, this could be, you know, ma more uh, high level issues as far as the cap table and making sure your grants to each founder has been documented properly. Uh, stock repurchase agreements have been executed that cover vesting with your founders. Uh, it could be other things that often do come up in the financing uh, stage of things where, you know, you're a North Carolina company, uh, or rather you're based in North Carolina, you're a Delaware C Corp, uh, but you're operating in five states and you haven't uh, filed in each of those five states uh, as a foreign entity authorized to do business. Those are, do those are items that we would uh, be looking at to try to identify, help you clean up. It's not the end of the world if uh, you haven't done every single thing, and it's usually the case that there are gaps that need to be uh, cleaned up, and that's where your law firm, um, you know, steps in to help you uh, because you're uh, focused and pr probably juggling a million things at once, and you're focused on getting your vision off the ground. So pre-term sheet, that is, uh, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are great formation tools out there, uh, better and better uh, you know, that, you that we find. Um, but starting uh, a relationship, whether it's and, and what I'll say this, uh, whether it's Fourscore or a different firm, we strongly recommend getting a relationship in place as soon as possible uh, when you're getting ready to to fundraise because. Uh, for formation work, uh, you know, again, solutions like Clerky and Gust can be really helpful and useful, um, but a relationship is essential to navigating uh, more uh, complex issues like negotiating with an investor and um, strategic hiring issues and items like that where you're going to want a relationship that you can count on and who are going to deliver when, when you need them. So I, I would just highlight that the corporate cleanup side at this stage and making sure you have a, a relationship, even if it doesn't mean, you know, we, we very much understand an early stage company needs to be very um, um, cautious in how they spend uh, limited funds, especially as you get off the ground and legal spend should not be a major expense um, in, in, in the very early days. And so we, we try to do our best to be as efficient as possible. Um, but even just getting the relationship, you can get a relationship in place and do the vetting of, is this firm going to be a good fit for what I value and prioritize? And then you can, you know, you can go at your own pace. Um, you don't have to commit to doing a bunch of work all at once. Um, but it's very important to get the relationship in place. Hey, Ben, we had a question in the yeah. chat box from Rachel yes. Miller at Throw Up. Does your firm help clients that receive SBIR or other governmental research slash prototype funding? Yes. Yeah, great question. Uh, that is, we have a number of clients uh, that have received uh, funding along those lines. So that, that's definitely something that uh, we, we see uh, pretty frequently, especially coming out of the, uh, you know, founders that are coming out of academia. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we, we do. Okay, um, if there aren't any other questions, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so the, uh, once you've done your cleanup, you're moving on to the term sheet uh, stage in, in the venture financing. And so when we're dealing with a an institutional fundraise, and this this usually means that, you know, unless you are a repeat founder who has exited three, four times, uh, you've probably, um, you know, built a business that has some traction and you have a number, you know, you need eight to $10 million to go scale it up. That's typically who institutional investors are, are, are looking for. They're looking for a proven team, uh, a business model that has received some signals in the market that uh, you know are showing traction, and you know that the the, the capital is is ready to be deployed to to uh, facilitate that scale up. There are definitely exceptions where you have 
uh, like I mentioned, the the serial entrepreneur who has that something at concept phase uh, that they're willing to write a check based on track record. But it's more common that you, you at this stage when you're ready for an institutional round, you've moved beyond you know issuing safes, doing a friends and family, doing angels. You're looking to get set up with an institutional investor that has a uh, strategic advantage to your comp for your company as well as uh, the, the the money in addition to the money itself, it, it's really, you know, you hear, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we're not professional investors. We interact with them frequently and, and we often hear them say money is, is not the reason to raise. It's, it's, it, the money's important, but the relationship and the strategic value for what that uh, lead investor is bringing to your company is what's so important. So um, when you're coming to at this this stage, you're usually receiving a term sheet from that institutional fund. You've probably had some conversations, or maybe many conversations, that you know it, it could be years, uh, and they're they're you know it's finally coming to fruition, or it, it could be a, a faster moving process. But they're they're sending you a term sheet that uh, you know laying out what they're prepared to invest as your lead investor. Other times, um, again, this is less typical with institutional investors, but say you are going after a syndicate, um, you know, in, in, or, or a you know, group of angels, and, and you're, you, you decide you're going to uh, have a term sheet uh, with basically what the offer is uh, that, so that you can share once you're done pitching. That's also, you know, commonly done. But again, with the institutional investor, the process will look like they send you the term sheet. And then you go to your, you know, you circle up with your business advisors, your attorneys, and you review um, and seek to make revisions where you can, um, you know, hopefully ideally have some leverage where you can, you know, bring the terms of the, in the term sheet uh, in a more favorable position. On the term sheet, um, again, some of this might be very familiar to uh, those listening, but you know, you're you're hammering out one of the probably the biggest uh, is your valuation in the term that you're hammering out in the term sheet. Figuring out uh, what your pre money valuation, post money valuation will be, what the the price uh, per share of the preferred stock being sold um, in the company uh, that that's what's being hammered out. Uh, in addition to that, you're talking about um, and you know, board composition. Are you are are you giving uh, away a board seat to your lead investor? Typically, with an institutional investor, you will be. Uh, that that lead investor will be taking a board seat. Um, and but you also may be negotiating um, who on the founding team is going to be. Is it going to be all the founders? Is it going to be one or two? Um, critical terms that need to be negotiated because you know these are this is going to lay the framework for. Um, the terms of your financing and what's going to be laid out in the actual definitive financing documents. So critical stage um, here, uh, getting the term sheet positioned as favorably as possible. Um, and that's that's where we would you know, be stepping in typically to help negotiate that once received from the institutional investor. Um, once that's, uh, well, actually, typically while that's in process, you know, we work with uh, the founding team uh, on getting the cap chart um, ready to go, the, the pro forma, uh, which models out essentially what the investment uh, from your institutional lead and, and others that will be filling up the round look like. Um, and once that's set, you know, you'd be moving and the, and the lead investor and the company um, have a consensus on the key terms. You move to signature. And, and the only other thing I was going to mention about the the term sheet, you'll see a lot of vari a lot of variety as far as how much is included. Um, sometimes the term sheet is one or two pages. Sometimes it's ten to twelve pages. And really, what that reflects is a comfort level um, and a preference on the investor side as far as how much they want to negotiate up front, um, or whether they have a preference to to negotiate more of the terms in the actual financing documents. Essentially, once we move past the term sheet, uh, we, you know, you say you go with a, a one-page, two-page term sheet that really just hits some of the high-level items, everything else will then be left and be negotiated in the principal financing documents. Um, so there's a wide range of what's, what's normal in that context. Um, okay. 
So uh, moving forward into kicking off. So at this, you know, and, and another thing I, I uh, wanted to mention off, you know, usually you're looking at a six to eight week process. Um, sometimes it, it, it can be shorter. It's, it, that's rare uh, because of the diligence steps and the drafting of documents and, you know, at least, you know, once or twice back and forth with the lead investors council. Um, but you're usually looking at a six to eight weeks. Sometimes it is longer, uh, depending on how motivated the parties are to, to move to closing. Um, and so, um, and, and actually, you know what, w w one other point on the term sheet, um, another element that, that you're figuring out and navigating here is you, you're dealing with your lead investor and you're at least starting the process of thinking about who all may fill up the round. You know, you, you might be raising $5 million and your lead investor is going to take two and a half or 3 million. Um, but you're also thinking about who might be filling up the round. Um, and the only thing I would say, we, we recently did uh, a deal that was atypical where we had two co-leads and that was probably the messiest deal, one, one of the messier deals, just in terms of coordinating with, uh, you know, two sets of investors, two, two sets of investors, lawyers. Um, but but that, that's a consideration you're, you're thinking about at the term sheets phase as well is who's my lead, who are the strategics that we want to bring in, um, who else is going to fill up the round, are we going to need more time? Um, and negotiate you know, to have additional closings for you know up to six months or something like that in the initial closing. Uh, that is also part of the process. Um, so once uh, this gets going, you, you've kicked it off. Uh, Fourscar, we we put together a deal team and a transaction checklist that essentially covers everything from A to Z as far as what needs to happen um, in the deal. We'll we hold a kickoff call with uh, our client, you. Uh, to help make sure you understand the timeline, process, and expectation. And part of why that's so important is the founder is, you know, often the founder or founding team is interfacing with their uh, institutional investor. And oftentimes it's their first time raising. We had a, actually a, a group, uh, very experienced, had had successful exits, but had never raised before a, a venture round. And so they were very unfamiliar with the process, despite their track record and pedigree. Um, and so, you know, just familiarizing and, and part of the consideration there is as the, you know, whether you're the CEO or just the founding team, you're wanting to, you know, communicate and have, and, and pro, uh, I won't say project, but you're wanting to make sure that you're invest, you're inspiring confidence in, in terms of your understanding of the process. And so uh, when you're getting questions and um, things are plugging along that you have a, a clear understanding of what's normal. Um, and this really that applies to, to the term sheet phase, um, understanding what's what's standard, what's normal and understanding the timeline for the deal and what all is actually involved there. So that, that's why we typically hold the kickoff call. Um, and then once that is squared away, we will schedule a kickoff call with the lead investors council. So if you're raising with Kleiner Perkins, we hop on uh, the phone with uh, their investor uh, council, uh, law firm that they're working with. And we basically, that, that's usually a short call. Sometimes it does start getting into diligence uh, matters. They might wanna get some IP diligence matters squared away up front, but usually it's more, it's, it's, a, it's a quicker 10, 15 minute call um, and kind of laying the groundwork. Um, of, and, and again, related to the term sheet, the, the norm is that the, the company and their counsel will draft the financing documents, uh, which we're going to talk about a little uh, in just a second, as far as what those consist of. Um, but that, that kickoff call familiarized with, with uh, both, both sides of, uh, on, the, on the legal side and lay a get a basic timeline in place as far as uh, what, what everyone's expecting as far as the first turn of the documents. Um, other steps involve, you know, you, you might be going into the round with your lead investor, uh, but you have, you know, you have a, a set of smaller investors that will be participating. Um, we will typically prepare some communication so that they uh, know who we are and set some expectations and, and provide a timeline so that they're clued in on the process. They might have already committed 
um, but getting, making sure they they feel plugged in and connected to the process uh, to keep them warm as you, as you move towards closing. Um, we then, you know, as part of our process, we, we use an investment questionnaire that basically provides us with some of the key information we need that is not included in the uh, term sheet. Um, and then we, you know, get to work on the financing documents. And so um, some here may be familiar with what the financing documents are, um, but, you know, the, the, the standard for venture capital deals is using the what what are uh, the NVCA NVCA docs, which the organization is the National Venture Capital Association, and it's you know large consortium that a uh, uh, group that has produced the model legal documents that are used as a starting point for most financing deals, and that consists of your stock purchase agreement. That's the document where the company sells preferred stock to its investors. You have your investor rights agreement, which is uh, somewhat self-explanatory, but contains key rights being granted uh, to the investor. Um, there, you have your right of first refusal and co-sale agreement, um, which again are, are two key rights that are um, documented separately. You have your amended and restated charter, um, which that's the document that will get filed with the Delaware Secretary of State um, when you are ready to close and that authorizes the preferred stock that's going to be sold to the investors. Um, and then you have your voting agreement. And so those are five core documents. Almost every deal starts with those documents. Um, there are exceptions. I don't think I've worked on a deal that did not start with those, with a venture finance deal that did not start with, with the model legal documents. But that, that is what, um, you're, we're starting with, uh, and again, on the company side, it, it's it's typically the company getting to work, preparing, taking those those as starting points and customizing to the terms of the term sheet. Hey, Ben, what was that abbreviation? Yes. The abbreviation that you went through, someone is asking to put it in the chat. So oh, I was yeah. Gonna do that. Yeah. It, so the the NDCA, uh, that, that stands for National Venture Capital Association. And so uh, those documents are, are readily accessible to anyone on on those uh, on their website. Uh, that's the National Venture Capital Association. Great, thanks, Ben. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so another key part, you know, basically when when you get going, you've gotten that term sheet in place. There's two major things happening. There's the drafting of the financing documents. Um, and primarily that's getting it, you know, tailored to the term sheet. But again, depending on how much detail was put into the term sheet, there may be a lot of items that are being negotiated uh, that are getting drafted by the company's council and then will be sent over to uh, the investor council and there's negotiation going back and forth. The second major item going on is diligence. And so you typically will receive a due diligence checklist from the investor council. And it covers a wide range of items, but they're basically looking at, you know, requesting that you set up a data room. You know, you might use Dropbox and set it up, you know, in accordance. And, and we, we, our firm, you know, the, your law firm is typically helping you assist with that. Sometimes founders, um, uh, you know, will, will uh, ha already have that in place. That's less typical, uh, but we're usually taking the due diligence letter, preparing a data room that contains all of the requested documents um, from the investor. And so those are your corporate records and charter documents, the charter for the, the company, your business plan and financials, um, any documents related to security issuances, whether that's to the founders, to employees, your stock plan, um, any material agreements, and that's often defined in the financing documents, um, but material agreements, things that are, are, are critical to the business, Anything related to litigation, hopefully that folder is empty for you. Um, and then employee documents, you might have benefit plans. Um, and then also IP. If you have uh, any IP registered, non-registered uh, IP, you know, you'd have uh, that typically as well put into your data room. And that way, investor council and their team can run through that and then surface questions, which there's always questions. They're almost always is there almost always is cleanup that surfaces during uh, the diligence process. Um, and some, some, are, some 
uh, cleanup is is more extensive than others, um, but it's not it's not unusual for things to to pop up and and you know whether it's uh, putting together some consents that need to be that, that were not uh, filed um, uh, or executed, I should say. Um, yeah, there, there's usually some sort of diligence request that will surface at that point. Um, and that, that's just the, the process of, of going through, making sure at the end of the day, we're working towards getting the investor council comfortable so that they can signal to the investor, we're good to go. We don't have any, uh, any more outstanding concerns uh, as far as uh, what the company has provided. Um, the next, that next bullet point, it's, is, you know, we, you know, with your company counsel, you'll hold what's called the rep, reps and warranties call. Um, this will probably be, if not the most boring one and a half to two hours of your life, it'll be up there. Uh, because basically you're going to get on the call. It's, it's I, and I'll, I'll uh, counter that by saying it's an extremely important call, but it is very boring because you're going to hop on uh, the phone with me and we're gonna read through representations and warranties. So a bunch of legal language that we try to boil down to make it as painless as possible. But this is these are representations and warranties, basically statements that the company is going to make in the stock purchase agreement uh, that is being executed as part of the financing. And basically it's things that you're saying are true. Um, and so this, for example, very simple example is, you know, you'd have a rep that says, uh, we, this is the company's capitalization. We've issued 10 million shares of common stock. We've issued this many options and you have a, a capitalization rep. And um, there's, you know, it's often 25, 26 reps and warranties that are in, in the stock purchase agreement. And we need to read through it and basically surface any issues that need to be added into uh, a disclosure schedule. And that is a part, the disclosure schedule is a part of the stock purchase agreement. It's typically an exhibit uh, added in. And basically what you're looking for is, are there any exceptions to what this statement is saying that we need to add in to make the statement true? Um, and the general rule there is to over-disclose. Um, you know, if, there's, if you're in doubt, it's a better rule of thumb because you're what you want. The objective here is you want all of those reps and warranties to be true or uh, to be addressed by putting any exceptions that in the disclosure schedule. If you do that, then there's no liability that you, you've done your, your best uh, to limit any exposure on the company's part um, from an investor down the line saying, hey, that wasn't true um, and you didn't disclose that and creating an issue for the company down the line. So it's an extremely important, um, if uh, painful process, but it's really important. Get the disclosure schedule in place. We, you know, send, we'll send that over to the investor council. They'll review that, ask any questions. Um, and then at that point, we're ready to send over the pro forma cap chart, first drafts of the uh, model docs, the investment documents to the investor council. Uh, they will then be reviewing those uh, and then and providing markups. And so it's back and forth um, of basically positioning the, the documents as favorably as possible to the company, if, if you're in our shoes, uh, representing the company, and for the investor trying to get as much uh, investors council, trying to get as much protection as possible um, for their, their client in that situation, the, the institutional fund. Hey, Ben, there was a question yeah. that I missed earlier from Greg. I yeah. apologize, Greg. Um, his question was, do you find that most entrepreneurs have an MVP and an LOI in hand before getting a pre-seed dilutive round, or do they have a compelling pitch deck backed by a no-tangle product? Hmm. Um, okay, I might, I might need you to tell me that second part again in a second, but generally speaking, you know, I I mean, it's the classic lawyer answer. Is it depends. Uh, I, I would say normally, you know, and, and actually, let me. Was the stage that that the question was asking uh, for a a, a, a pre seed round? Yeah. Hey, Ben. This is great. Yeah, yeah. It's it's for a pre seed non dilutive round or or even a dilutive round 
um, with an accredited investor. So we're not talking about a, a institutional investor. The reason is, uh, I don't know if, if I'm putting the cart before the horse, should I go out and work with Foursquare to get the articles in corporation, get everything filed, get everything done, have everything set up, and then go out and seek funding? Or should I, because of the risk adversity of investors in the early round, should I build a product, get some product market fit, get some traction, get some LOIs, then go and say, okay, now let's put some investment in building out the articles in corporation filings and everything. It's like chicken or egg, which one do I do? Yeah, no, that's that's a fair question, and it is the that that is the type of question that you know we we definitely understand that founders wrestle with because you're basically trying to figure out how to drive your vision forward uh, with limited resources, uh, and so I I would say the, the the distinction though would be you should I think you should definitely file your articles you know your your certificate of incorporation in Delaware if you're going to be a C corp uh, get get your legal entity in place um and, and there may be some gray area there as far as if, if you are you know 50 50 on whether you think you have something sure you know sketch things out maybe do some validation testing um but if you're generally speaking you know pretty sure that you're moving forward with it and you are going to start um you know if you're going to put any money into the business if you're going to uh you know, I, I think getting set up at the very least as an entity is worthwhile for liability protection, getting a bank account set up. Um, but I, I think so it, the answer really can depend. It, it depends on, um, you know, where you are as far as your comfort level that and, and conviction that you will be moving forward with this. Um, I think, you know, generally speaking, again, we're not professional investors, but we spend so much time around them. You know, the the more you can do to validate, the the better. Uh, you know, it's just a, a, a as a, as a risk averse measure of just trying to do as much validation and, and developing that conviction that you have something. There's signals out there that you're addressing, uh, and, and signals that are are responsive to the the need that you're addressing. I think that that can do a lot to mitigate your risk. Um, you know, so I, I would say usually the answer is going to be it, it makes sense to at least set up your company. Unless you're just truly not sure whether this is, you know, a viable business. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Carolyn, were there any other questions? Yes, there was one more from Rachel here. Is it your recommendation to register in Delaware or can registration occur in North Carolina? Is the benefit for tax purposes? Okay. Yeah. Um, so very good question. When you are going to raise with an institutional venture fund, 99, I, I, don't, I haven't seen an exception. But so I, I would say almost certainly you will need to be a Delaware C Corp. Um, and there's a number of reasons. It's, it's not necessarily tax uh, and, and we're not tax lawyers. So I wouldn't want to, uh, I want to make clear, I'm not providing any tax input. Um, but uh, number one, investors are comfortable with Delaware. There's a very established uh, body of law there. There's a dedicated court uh, for corporate matters. There's an invest, a strong investor preference, and that's those. That's on from the venture capital side. That's down to their limited partners, the LPs uh, that have pulled money together in the fund. Uh, there is a strong comfort level with Delaware, uh, and so there's a number of reasons. Um, that, you know, almost always, if you are not a Delaware C Corp, uh, they're going to request at the term sheet level that you convert uh, to a Delaware C Corp. But that, so again, the, the big part of that is if you're going to raise an institutional uh, venture fund, it, it, uh, raise from an institutional venture fund, um, because if you're not, if you're going to, you know, bootstrap, if you're going to raise uh, from some angels, uh, you may well, uh, and, and actually I should be careful saying raise from some angels, but if you're, you're going to raise a friends and family round, um, you may, we often deal with uh, clients that are set up as a North Carolina LLC, uh, and that makes sense for them uh, up until a certain phase in the business, at which point 
you know, they can convert. You can convert the LLC into a, a North Carolina C Corp into or North Carolina LLC, either one, into a Delaware C Corp. So you can handle the conversion. So I'd say the, the advice would be if, if you are going to raise from a venture capital fund, you're going to need to be a Delaware C Corp. Um, if you're unsure uh, as far as what your objectives are, are likely, to do, there's some more analysis to do as far as what makes the most sense. Part of it that, you know, I would say is definitely a tax component um, as far as whether it's more advantageous giving your, you know, next six to 18 months horizon, whether it's to be an LLC uh, versus a C-Corp. So that it, it, it's a, that gets into a little bit more of a nuanced question that you, know, you should definitely get uh, sound counsel on as far as, you know, walking through all the uh, considerations there. But to, 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 again, just to recap, Delaware C Corp is, is almost always going to be required if you're raising from a, a venture fund. Thanks, Ben. Um, Definitely. I think those are all the questions Regina said. I found that on the other hand, a lot of investors like to invest in companies in their state or the region, for example, Southeast. Okay. I think that's it for the questions. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's a fair point. I mean, and, and, you know, just similar to the institutional investor, you know, who has the preference for, uh, you know, Delaware C Corp, uh, you know, if you're raising from, let's say it's, whether it's Boulder, Colorado, or Raleigh, North Carolina, if your investors are there, they, they might not care, or they might, like you said, have a preference for a company that is um, located close by, but, um I think it's definitely worth exploring as to as to the why. Um, if you if you're, if you're being asked, if, if you have venture funding in mind for at some point down the line, um, and they're telling you they'd rather you be, you know, a Colorado C Corp or a North Carolina C Corp, it's probably worth exploring with the investor why they want that, and then seeing if it makes sense, um, you know, for the company. Okay, um, so moving on to in the timeline. Um, so the last thing we just talked about, you know, you're at this stage, diligence negotiation, you're, you know, you're working through getting the investor really comfortable that, you know, they understand the company, they understand the capitalization, they understand uh, basically the ins and outs of what they're investing, writing a check um, uh, to be an investor in, in as the company. And then you're also, you know, hammering out the definitive financing documents, those model legal docs, getting them in line with the term sheet, negotiating. Uh, they're definitely, you know, no term sheet covers every issue uh, in the financing documents. And that's typically, you know, from a process standpoint, there's a good bit of that that's going to be handled by your law firm. Um, and usually what we're doing is, uh, you know, you're getting there, there's changes being made to the documents that sometimes it's, you know, on the one end of the spectrum where it really is, it's, it's a uh, word choice and it's not really a substantive issue. And, you know, that your, your law firm is going to be kind of accepting those most likely and, and really concentrating its attention on substantive issues. And so we're usually, when we're going through, when we get red lines back, when we get documents back from the investor council, we're working to boil them, boil the issues down to a list of substantive issues. We're hopping on a call with you, helping you understand what what's what's that issue, what the implications are, what's the risk, um, and and then you know getting you uh, you know positioned to make a, a decision that you feel comfortable with uh, and that you think is best for the founding team and the company. Um, so that is you know, an overview through that diligence and negotiations is the only other thing I was going to add on is, uh, you know, typically, as we mentioned earlier, you know, at the pre-seed seed round, you know, you're, you know, friends and family are you know, writing checks, you're raising through maybe some angels using safes, convertible notes. Um, you know, the, the series A financing is typically the first price round um, it's not always the case, and especially because of the, the size of, of seed rounds have grown significantly. Um, and so there, there actually are preferred stock, you know, being sold in, in seed rounds. But, but typically your series A, your first price round, that is going to be uh, the messiest 
round um, in terms of cleanup that's needed. Um, in terms of usually you're going to have all these, you know, converting securities. You're going to have your safes that are all converting in that round, and then they're they're no, you know, the safes are essentially terminated once they've converted into preferred stock. But we usually like to give clients a heads up. Uh, you 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 can often think that you know Series A uh, is this hard, and then your Series B is going to be a little bit more complicated. It's actually the opposite. Your Series A is your first price round uh, is usually going to be the most complicated. And then when you from from the the standpoint of the diligence uh, and the standpoint of drafting documents, when you go to your Series B, your next price round. You're often starting from, you know, no, no, you're starting with your Series A documents and basically revising those documents to fit the the terms of, of you know, the new terms uh, from a new term sheet with a, a new lead investor. Um, so that that is often a surprise, but you know, but that and that manifests itself in uh, Series A is usually the most expensive. It's actually more because it's it, it's just more time. Uh, consuming, you know, dealing with converting securities, dealing with corporate cleanup, um, things that need to happen there. Um, and there's more drafting work that, that's often being done in those initial uh, documents. Um, okay, moving into the pre-closing. So you're getting ready for closing. You're, you're pretty close on the documents or you, you've gotten final sign-off with your documents. Uh, with the lead investor. So at that point, you start talking uh, about a, a target closing date with the investor and their lead counsel. Um, you're, you're getting that slated uh, so that everyone's on the same page as far as where you're working forward. Uh, signature blocks, it's something that, uh, you know, Foursquare reaches out to, your, your law firm will typically be reaching out to your investors lead, but also your strategics and others that are filling the round uh, to get their signature blocks. Um, and getting signature pages prepared uh, for closing. Um, you'll do, you know, final confirmation of the pro forma. Uh, and usually at that point, it's, it's pretty set because it's, it's been passed through, you know, a number of times by the company and the lead investor council. Um, and then you're, you're moving, uh, you know, closer and closer to that, to being ready to close. And, and the, um, the one, one I know I was going to mention uh, for pre-closing and closing you know, the, once you've gotten to the point, a, a common question uh, that we answer is as we're working through the uh, negotiating of documents uh, with the lead investor is when can we send documents out to our other non-lead investors? And we typically will recommend, you know, waiting until, uh, you know, the, the documents are, are in final form. They, they've been signed off on both on both sides for the investor and the company, um, or very, very close. Um, and generally speaking, you're not, you know, the, 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 the process is typically you, you, you get, reach a point of, of sign off with your lead investor and you are not negotiating with your other investors. Um, and that there, there can be exceptions, but usually your, your other non-lead investors, they're reviewing the documents so that they understand uh, the terms and they, they've, they've seen the term sheet, um, but they're, you know, the, the company at that point is not really wanting to have to go and try to make revisions. Sometimes a very important strategic investor might make a request and what that will involve then is the company having to circle back up with the lead investors council, going to the lead in investor. And, and so it can prolong the process. So we try to communicate and you know, try to coach the, the company to commu be communicating, sending the in simple things like sending the documents as PDFs so that the people understand these are documents that have been negotiated and we're sending them for review so that you're you know comfortable and acclimated to what the deal terms are, but not looking to revisit and renegotiate terms um, at that stage with uh, minority investors. Hey, Ben, question here yes. from Tim. What type of funding should be allocated to legal fees to get to Series A financing? To get so to legal fees, um, and, and do you mean to close a Series A deal? Like what you can expect to spend on a Series A deal, or do you mean how much money should be allocated to for all the legal that you're going to spend before you get to your Series A? 
Yeah, Tim, if you don't mind providing that clarification either in the chat box or unmuting yourself. And while we wait on that, I, you know, these last two, I, I realize the time, I'd like to save time for any other questions. I can quickly run through these last two. And, um, you know, if, if we hear from Tim, uh, yeah, I can, I'm happy to answer that. The, the closing process. Ben, sorry, he, sorry, he did give some clarification. He said, oh, yeah. all these to series A. Oh, I'm sorry, Caroline, it cut out on me. Sorry, all fees to Series A was his response. Okay, okay. I I think I understand that you're saying uh, leading up to, you know, so I'll answer in two parts. Really, the, the amount of spend on legal fees before you get started on the Series A, that really, that that's kind of hard to estimate because it, it, it you know, you're, you're for, like a formation package, uh, you know, you're typically that that's typically a fixed cost. It's, it's kind of easy to assess um, for four at four square. We do a Delaware C Corp startup package on a flat fee of, of twenty five hundred dollars. It's, it's, it's fixed and it includes everything you need to get the company set up, all the documents in place for the founding team. That can definitely vary by firm or there, there, there are other you know, solutions out there that, you know, if you aren't ready for the relationship, um piece or aren't needing that yet you can find other um you know that that might be less uh and you know than that but the the other costs that you're estimating it really has to do with what has the company done to date um in the sense of have is there a lot of corporate cleanup to do uh you know sometimes it, it's very clean and so you know you have a you know the corporate documents have been uh, put together, you know, they, and they're, they, they were done correctly. Um, and then there really isn't much to, you know, for the company uh, on, on the legal side, except maybe there's some contracts, maybe there's things like that, you know, that are being reviewed. Um, you know, and, and again, it, it, part of what's hard to answer about estimating is it really can be a function of the business. You, you might have, you know, if, if you're in a, a business that, implicates a lot of privacy issues, you might have had to spend a good bit on data privacy and getting, you know, uh, your uh, compliance security, uh, information security uh, regime up to speed so that you're ready to start actually selling to enterprise customers uh, that won't, you know, talk to you unless you have those ducks in a row. Um, or you could have a much, you know, easy, uh, a much less expensive path if you're really going straight to consumers in a, in a, uh, a space that just doesn't have a lot of upfront asks uh, that you're going to need legal on. Um, but to get, you know, so I, I, I think that you're asking about the estimate as far as before a Series A. We usually, when we're, but to answer about like what you can expect from a price round, we typically tell clients to expect that a price round is going to cost between 25 and 40 K. That is a normal, you know, that's the range that we typically see. And that's, that's pretty consistent with what's market. Um, and where it might push things up towards that higher end in the range is if you have converting securities. That's going to mean that you have more than one set of preferred stock. Uh, more than one class of preferred stock. And you know, there's just more complicating factors there. Um, but that's that's a typical range, 25 to 40 K for a price round uh, financing. Um, hopefully I answered your question, Tim, and feel free to pipe up uh, if, if I didn't, or if you have any follow-ups. Uh, so just to, to close this out, um, you know, the, the closing process, um, you know, one thing that's highlighted at the top there, basically, if you are not registered, if your company is not registered already with the SEC, we need to get essentially login credentials, which are known as Edgar codes. Uh, we, we help you get those with the SEC so that that way you can, uh, once you have your Edgar codes, then the company is ready to, fight, to, make, to make regulatory filings uh, with the SEC. Um, so that's a, a key step. Uh, sending signature packets uh, to all the investors. We send use we use EverSign, uh, but basically you're sending out for e-signature. Sending a communication, and this is important to your investors with wire instructions and the act, the exact final investment amount as far as what 
um, amount is to be wired to the company. And then the company is going to be typically confirming receipt of the funds. There's not uh, the way we operate and, and, and typically what, what's done. We, we don't receive the, you know, your law firm is not usually receiving the funds. It's going directly to the company account. Um, and, you know, once everybody is on the same page, especially with lead investor counsel, company counsel, and the company, um, that, that is, and, you know, when we would re release signature pages, you know, that we would typically hold those in escrow until we have sign off from all the parties involved. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just leave that up there and then because of time, just move over to quest questions, but th these are some of the items that are involved post-closing. Um, that we assist with. Uh, one of the big ones is, you know, 409 evaluation is, is something that you should move forward with um, in the, once you've closed the price round and, and that helps set the exercise price um, uh, for uh, the company's uh, share price. Um, so uh, I, and I apologize, I meant to leave some more time than five minutes, but would love to take any questions um, that we have. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, those are all the questions that I'm seeing. Okay. Everyone, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask, or if you're more comfortable, you can put those in the chat box and I can read them aloud for you. Ben, um, while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions, what is the best way for someone to connect with you afterwards if they think of any questions or would like to uh, inquire about Force Force services? Yes, no, thank you for asking. And I should have probably left this up. So my email is ben at foursquarelaw.com. Uh, and I can put that in the chat. Um, I realize that was at, on the last page. And feel, also feel free to connect with me on link, LinkedIn. Uh, Benjamin T. Jacob, uh, I should be pretty easy to find. Um, but yeah, reaching out by email, um, you know, we often do, you know, sh short intro calls to kind of get a sense of what needs are and whether, you know, we're, it's a good fit on both sides. Um, and we're happy to, you know, we, we, we really love what we do. We're getting to work with founders and we like to, um, do our best to, you know, tell you really frankly, whether you're, you know, whether you should wait to move forward on some work or, or whether it sounds like it's the right time um, really to try to best position you uh, to be successful uh, bringing uh, to life, you know, what you're wanting to build. Thanks, Ben. Um, Gene, do you want to go first? I see that you raised your hand and then we had a question in the chat box. Uh, yeah, I'll just ask a quick question. Ben, I came in a moment late, but um, great presentation you just made. Can okay. you talk a little bit about your office here in Raleigh? If there's any specific industries you folks are working on or things that you're not comfortable with? And I'm asking not from the entrepreneur side, but I'm on the capital management side. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, thanks, Gene. Um, so, you know, our, so I, I am based out of our, our Silicon Valley office, but I work with our Raleigh team all the time. Um, we don't have specific industries we focus on particularly because what we do really is uh, across, across the board um, relevant, uh, you know, regardless of business. Um, you know, so we, we represent a lot of early stage technology companies. Uh, we also represent companies that are, you know, been around for 15, 20, 25 years. Um, but most of our clients are early stage technology companies, somewhere between pre-seed, series A, series B. Um, the, 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 the one thing I, I would mention is we are not, we, we don't do IP in-house. Um, so for IP filings, uh, more nuanced uh, counsel, um, part of what we would do is, and, and one of the things that, you know, our clients have, have uh, appreciated and the feedback we've gotten is we really like to, you know, what we do is venture financings, M&A, and serving as outside general counsel for, for companies that are not at that stage yet where they're ready to hire a, a general counsel um, for the company. And so we like to, uh, you know, quarterback the average. There's a, you know, say you need very nuanced, well, whether it's IP needs or uh, very nuanced data privacy uh, work that needs to be done to get yourself ready for the latest change in GDPR. Um, we will, uh, you know, 
bring in a specialist from our network uh, that we work with regularly that we know share our values and are, you know, produce excellent work and help quarterback the effort there, bring them in, making sure you feel comfortable um, and then off and running. But that that's the, the those two areas, data privacy, um, you know, there, there's certain basic items, you know, that we definitely handle, you know, getting terms and conditions, privacy policies in place. Um, but for more nuance, especially on the compliance side, we would bring a specialist in and recommend um, that. Okay, thank you very much. I've, you've got an email yeah. from me already, so thank you. Okay, okay, thanks, Gene. Thanks, Ben. And we'll take one last question that I'm seeing in the chat box from Sammy. What is your opinion on using CAP table, CAP? On, on using cap, a CAP table? Cap table, C A P table. Uh, you may not be familiar. Is that a is that a, is that a software provider? Uh, the name. Sorry, I'm unsure, I'm Sammy. If you can okay. provide some context, yeah. Sammy, we'll make sure that you're connected to Ben directly um, as we are wrapping up here, but. Um, Gina is saying that's an accounting question. Um, so yes, so we'll make sure that you're connected directly to Ben. Um, I'm just seeing a lot of great feedback in the chat box, very clear and informative presentation. So Ben, we thank you very much. Absolutely. And as a, yeah, as a reminder, this was recorded. It will be posted right to YouTube channel and then shared via the meetup group where you registered for this event. And I encourage you to reach out to Ben directly at Ben, B-E-N, at fourscorelaw.com. You can always reach out to me and I can connect you as well. Uh, thanks again, Ben. I hope everyone has a great day. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Caroline.